Come back. The Liberal Minister of Labor declined to intervene. But that year, R.B. Bennett's Conservatives were swept into power, and the new Minister of Trade and Commerce, H.H. H. Stevens, launched an investigation into the motion picture industry. Many of the independents appeared afraid to testify. Mr. Nathanson, after all, had a lot of Hollywood friends. There was enough evidence, however, to build a case. It appeared that if you build a theater, Nathanson would build one across the street. If you built near one of his existing theaters, Nathanson would make sure you didn't get very many good movies. The commission decided that a monopoly did indeed exist within the movie industry and that Famous Players Canadian was at the center of it. Furthermore, the system of block booking, which was dictated from New York, made it virtually impossible for an independent filmmaker to get his movie shown in a Canadian theater. The Attorney General of Ontario prosecuted under the Combines Investigation Act. Famous players, its subsidiaries, and the Hollywood distributors were the defendants. Colonel John Cooper, a lobbyist for the Hollywood companies, worked hard behind the scenes. The prosecution presented its case in such a curiously half-hearted manner that the Canadian Moving Picture Digest, a trade paper, called the trial a travesty of justice. There was ample evidence that Nathanson and his boys used robber baron tactics to squeeze out the opposition, but this did not appear to be contrary to Canadian law. The Supreme Court of Ontario decided there was not sufficient evidence to convict. Thus, Hollywood retained effective control of Canadian theatres, and the only Canadian product that made its way to the screens were short films stuffed between the features which would soothe the Canadian spirit. Montreal Maroons, nothing. Toronto Maple Leafs, nothing. End of the first period. Another General Motors hockey broadcast brings you Carol Lucas and his General Motors Orchestra, Ernest Dainty, and of course, Foster Hewitt. Hello, Canada, and hockey fans in the United States. Getting ready to start the second period, and there's no score. Toronto Maple Leafs, nothing. Montreal Maroons, nothing. And once again, in the gondola at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. And so, into the homes of more than a million Canadian listeners, where every Saturday evening, you will hear the voice of Roland Baudry, or Charlie Harwood, or Foster Hewitt, bringing news of the varying fortunes of your favorite hockey team. We did last night. So do I. Wasn't it an awful party? I didn't enjoy it a bit, did you? Oh, nothing like that. Oh, this little bastard coming forward, I guess. Skates down the right side, swerves over on the left wing, over the blue line, and half day blocks him. Day getting up speed, going back to the goal, comes racing down to center ice, over the blue line, trotted off to the corner, working up in front of the goal. He shoots, and it's very close as Beverly made a nice save. Clears off to the side, another scramble. Back to the maroon goal, Hooley Smith. Let's Ward take it. Ward down the right side, swerving over at center. He's going in close. Here's Wetter right, and he shoots, he scores! And so another game has passed into history, with all teams racing down the stretch toward the annual playoffs for the Stanley Cup, that ancient trophy which is affectionately known all over Canada as the battered mug. Gordon Sparling, after his misadventure with Bairn's father and carry-on sergeant, had been hired on by Ben Norrish who, if nothing else, was Canada's most durable producer. Norrish headed up Associated Screen News of Montreal, 
which had been formed largely with CPR money in 1921. ASN had been producing travelogues and industrial shorts, but the bread and butter came from the laboratories. Almost all major Hollywood studios had their release prints made at ASN. Hollywood would not be pleased if a Canadian production house began to seriously compete with them for the rich Canadian market, and Mr. Norrish was not about to bite the hand that fed him. In an interview, Mr. Norrish declared that Canada, with its limited population, had no more use for a large moving picture studio than Hollywood had for a pulp mill. He advised Canadians not to invest their money in movies. Chubby little fellow, couldn't see his feet for the last 15 years, I guess. But a very, uh, had sort of a native shrewdness. And somebody summed it up very nicely by saying that he was a farmer. And he said, you know what good horse traders farmers are. But Norrish never put his neck out. Mr. Norrish had a firm policy. He would make some short films, but nothing so ambitious that it would threaten his American friends. Norrish liked to see his people making movies like this promotional film for the Track Tractor Company. From the mines, a snowmobile took me to a lumber camp in the bush. <laughs> that was an experience. We made about six miles an hour. It was snowing when we arrived, but the track tractors were running, and those diesel engines plowed right along. You may not know it, Dad, but the international diesel tractors have a very clever, exclusive feature. A unique arrangement converts it into a gasoline engine for starting, so that it can be cranked by hand even in the coldest weather. After about a minute, it automatically switches to diesel operation. Well, I'll be done. As we were flying out, I kept thinking of those track tractor trains on their long swing over the frozen lakes and of the men driving them. Both the men and the machines are well suited to our work. I decided right then that my biggest job was to get you interested in the opportunities waiting up there. Dad, we need to expand. The North Country is the logical place. And with track tractor equipment, there's no reason why. Now, just a minute, you fellow. Don't you try to high pressure me. I don't need any convincing. Eh? I'm sold already. Oh, boy. And what's more, I'm going to make it tough for you by putting you in charge of our new Northern Division. Oh, Dad, that's great. Sparling had gone to work for Norrish on the understanding that he'd be allowed to make some short movies for the theaters, in addition to his work on industrial and promotional films. It was pretty obvious that you couldn't make pictures in Canada that would uh, pay for themselves, features, that is. So when uh, I uh, talked to Norrish about the idea of theatrical shorts, that was what was in my mind. The budgets were very low, the subject matter was to be non-controversial, and the early product, as Gordon Sparling was the first to admit, was pretty painful. Do you remember this young lady? Ten long years ago, Doris Elizabeth Hyde of Toronto was chosen from the youngsters of the whole Dominion as Canada's loveliest child. Here she is with Colonel Cockshoot and again with her proud father and mother. A portrait of Doris was painted by Joshua Smith, RBA, and a miniature of it was presented to Her Majesty Queen Mary to hang in her famous doll's house at Windsor Castle. A rose from the garden of Canadian childhood. Since then, a whole decade has rolled by. Through the mists of time, we return to 1933. A new Doris Elizabeth greets us this side of the years. Still lovely, but a child no more. Doris! You're Doris Elizabeth Hyde, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm baby Rosemary. Oh, yes, I've often heard you on the radio and seen you in the movies, too. Yes, and I've heard a lot about Canada's loveliest child. 
keep it a practice and be famous so young, isn't it? <laughs> Let's sit down and talk about it. All right. How old are you? I'm just 14. Gee, you're way ahead of me. I was born the year you were chosen Canada's loveliest child. Can you remember those days? Well, it's a bit hazy. I was only four years old then. And after all, ten years is a long, long time ago. Gradually, Sparling was able to overcome the minuscule budgets and his nervous producer, and his Canadian cameo series for Canadian theaters were soon of international quality. For a number of years, we were strictly instructed that no publicity should go out to uh, outside of the country. Why? Because he was very worried that the American producers would feel that here was new competition and would take uh, their business away from them and wouldn't uh, have their uh, prints made up here, which, of course, I think was ridiculous because I'm sure they weren't that worried about any little company up in Canada that was mm. going to cut into their, their business. Sparling kept pressuring Norrish for a sound studio. There were none in Canada. It wasn't until 1936, 10 years after Al Jolson and the Warner Brothers had made the first talkie, that Sparling succeeded. And that was only because Shell Oil, a very good client of ASN, wanted to make a dramatic promotional film which couldn't be shot anywhere but on a soundstage. It was built by CPR architects and engineers who were more accustomed to building hotels. We incidentally had sound trouble there too because of the first winter all the, uh, uh, in the concrete, apparently a lot of crickets had been sealed in, and uh, as the place got warm, they would start up there chirping, and the sound man would have to go around with a broomstick banging on the floor to make them stop. Sparling belonged to a select group. In the 1930s, there were no more than a dozen movie directors in all of Canada. Yes, it was a small group of people, uh, working in Canada, and very few of them were working together. They were isolated uh, between each other, and then there was the great isolation from the world of filmmaking, which was mostly Hollywood in those days. It was a little bit of English influence, but so far as everybody, uh, they, they had their eye on Hollywood. And you, you were always w wishing to know how people were getting their effects or what new things were coming along or how you could do things more efficiently. And uh, you, had to, if you, you had to invent things that if you only knew, it would have saved a lot of work. Rhapsody in two languages, an impression of a day in Montreal in 1934 was a triumph of Sparling's ingenuity. The day is over, but the night is young. It had Canada's first original music score, written by Howard Fogg, and it looked twice as expensive as it really was. Mm -hmm. 
even a film like this, much more sophisticated than the American product of the time, had distribution problems. Well, then the first obstacle was that uh, the censors wouldn't uh, give their uh, approval, the Quebec censors, which meant you couldn't play in any theater in Quebec. Played up in Toronto long before it played in Montreal. And it was only after a whole lot of uh, work behind curtains was done to get it into Montreal uh, by the argument that uh, those scenes were being uh, seen uh, regularly at the nightclub just around the corner. And finally, permission was given. Well, then the next hurdle was that the theater manager of the Palace Theater was a nice place to start your run, because it was the biggest theater in Montreal. But George Rotsky, the little manager, uh, said, who cares about uh, uh, Montreal? Uh, I don't want to play it. So it was pulled out, and he ran a picture, uh, one of the Fitzpatrick travel talks, on uh, nightlife in Chicago. Everybody was going to the movies, but Canadians weren't seeing much of Canada in their movie houses. The only other Canadian content in the theaters were short clips that were stuck on to American or British newsreels. Roy Tash of Toronto was the dean of Canadian newsreel photographers. An obligatory subject for Tash and all the other newsreel men were Canada's biggest tourist attraction, the Dion Quintuplets. It is perhaps indicative of the state of the Canadian movie industry that only the newsreels of the Quints were shot in Canada. The famous family starred in several feature films, but they were all done in Hollywood. As a matter of fact, Canada was getting a fair bit of exposure on the movie screens of the world. Most of it was about Mounties. All of it was shot in Southern California. And very few Canadians, including the government of Canada, were the least bit concerned. After all, Renfrew of the Royal Mounted was very good for the tourist trade. Wonderful country, Canada. You get used to it. I told you before you couldn't get away with it, and I meant it. But no, you had ideas. You wanted to be the big shot. You double-crossed me, eh? You'd wait till we had the dough, then you'd go howling to the law. All right, I'll show you what we do with double-crossers. I'll give you something you won't forget, just like Kelly got. And that, little boys and little girls, concludes the seventh chapter of our thrilling mystery serial, Constable Holly, sir. Sergeant Renfrew, Constable. At ease. That radio kind of fooled me. Nothing like a bit of wireless for excitement, eh? It's the only excitement that ever happens around this station. Could I get you a spot of tea? Woman who cooks for me lives just down the street. Won't take a minute. Thanks. I could stand a bite. I'll take over your post. No need, sir. Nothing ever happens here. Ha, 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 ha!
been going on here? Within my heart, no temper, like a peaceful love. So it must be nature's gift for everything In a somewhat more pedestrian manner, the Canadian government's Motion Picture Bureau in Ottawa was also aiming its meager production at the tourist trade. Of the 160 movies listed in the 1930 catalog, all but 11 were tourist films, and the few other films still concentrated on fish and forests. In depression-ridden Canada, the government did not give a high priority to film. The Ontario government had disbanded its film bureau entirely, and the federal government refused until 1934 to buy any sound equipment. When the Bureau finally got sound, their writers went to work with a vengeance and created some of the most incredibly florid soundtracks in the history of the documentary film. The woods re-echo with the sound of axes as the undercut is made, which fells the tree in the desired direction. And as the befoliaged monarchs crash groundward, Lumberjacks at all points of the compass are busily engaged. Snap, off she goes. It's no parlor game, this, but to the hardy lumberman, it's just another topping experience. When they dubbed it snaking, they selected a pretty apt term. The logs are no respecter of neighbors in making their forced way over piles of brother furs, very much as a boa constrictor bounding through the jungle. Add to the sharp bark of the woodsman's axe and the crashing of trees and logs, the puffing and grunting of these valiant donkey engines. Given a convenient stream, the logs are snaked to a skidway, which shoots them into the water, bound for the mill. In 1935, the Motion Picture Bureau made a feature-length film. Using old footage, they compiled a history of the 1914-18 war. Lest We Forget was a competent film and was well received by the critics, but not many people went to see it. This little Bosnian town was early astir that fateful Sunday morning for the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary and his consort, were paying Sarajevo a royal visit. As the royal procession wended its way through the narrow streets, a Bosnian student pushing through the crowd fired two shots, killing the royal pair instantly. To the world at large, the assassination was but another episode in the tragic story of the Habsburgs. Canada was at war. From the national capital, the word sped eastward and westward through the night. From the offices and workshops of the great cities, from the surf-beaten shores of the maritime, from the banks of the majestic